Starting right now on ABC's This Week, Rampage. He came back with a gun and opened fire. The moment of attack, the heroes who saved lives. This morning, we're at Fort Hood with breaking details and taking on the critical questions. Plus, culture of cover-up. I don't have the complete facts. That is incredibly frustrating. The head of GM grilled over a massive car defect linked to multiple deaths. Should you feel safe behind the wheel? And campaign cash. Keep our eyes on the prize. The Supreme Court strikes down limits on donations. Will it protect your freedom of speech? Or is our democracy now for sale? From ABC News, this week with George Stephanopoulos begins now. Good morning. I'm Martha Raddatz in Fort Hood, Texas, a tight-knit community reeling from another horrific mass shooting this week, the second in five years. We'll have complete coverage of the story here shortly, including the latest on the investigation. But first, as we come on the air, breaking news in the hunt to find that missing Malaysia Air 777. We're learning that an Australian ship may have heard the pingers from Flight 370's black boxes just hours ago. Just yesterday, the Chinese reported they too were investigating so-called acoustic events. It's a critical time in the search. The batteries powering those pingers could die today, 30 days after the plane disappeared. We have two reports this morning, beginning with Clayton Sandell in Australia. Clayton? Good morning, Martha. That's right. After that Chinese Navy ship reported hearing two pulse signals that are consistent with what you would expect to hear from an airplane's black boxes, the Australians wanted to send their own ship to check it out. It's called the Ocean Shield, and it's carrying underwater search gear that belongs to the U.S. Navy. But now that ship, which is 350 miles from the Chinese vessel, is staying in place because it has its own lead to chase. They've now heard a third mysterious underwater sound. Now, keep in mind, the Australians leading the search here say these are important and encouraging leads, but stress they cannot yet verify if any of these signals are connected in any way to Malaysia 370. There's another development this morning. The high priority search area has shifted again. That's because of a new analysis of those last communications transmitted from the plane to a satellite, now suggesting the Boeing 777 was going faster than first thought. That would put it going into the ocean very near where the Chinese picked up their signal. Now a British ship is expected to arrive on the scene early Monday to help determine if this is something or just another false lead. But right now, it is the most promising lead in this search that has now stretched nearly a month. Martha. Thanks, Clayton. While investigators still have found no sign of the jet, they are learning lessons that could prevent another missing plane mystery like this one. Here's ABC's David Curley. Dozens of flights, a flotilla of ships, hundreds of pairs of eyes, and still not one piece of debris from the Malaysian 777 has been recovered. Still, the mystery of Flight 370 is already providing lessons. The most obvious, how in 2014 can we not know where a jetliner is? And in a world where our every move seems to be tracked, we cannot let another aircraft simply disappear. So, lesson number one, keeping track of aircraft. Should we install GPS transmitters in all commercial aircraft, which would transmit to a satellite where they are every few minutes? I think this is just unacceptable. Uh, the fact that, you know, you have GPS in a subcompact car on the highway and not on, you know, on board a commercial aircraft for 300 people. A delayed FAA next generation air traffic control system would include GPS transmissions. But this morning, the Airline Pilots Association is saying it is time now for GPS. I really do think given the galvanizing reality that we have lost an airplane and we have no idea where it is, uh, we really do have to retrofit the fleet. Lesson two. What about those black boxes? This morning, the batteries in those pingers will start fading. Some suggest instead of just keeping all the data on the boxes in the aircraft, why not stream or burst the data to satellites on the aircraft's performance as well? In many cases, the boxes are not recovered, or when they are recovered, they're damaged beyond, beyond any repair. But broadband streaming to a satellite is not cheap. We don't have enough satellites up there to be able to take the huge amount of bandwidth. We have 93,000 flights per day, and even if you just cut that in half, that is a tremendous amount of data. Lesson three, who's in charge? Currently, the country where the flight crashes, 
or the flight operator, if it's in international waters, heads the investigation. But as the Malaysians have shown, with conflicting and the slow release of information, not all countries may be up to that task. Yes, it was uh, disabled before. We cannot determine exactly what ACAS has been disabled. There's no other way of putting it, quite frankly. They have bungled it. Uh, from the beginning. So why not create an international investigative body? It's clear that we need that because uh, the, the, the first few hours of these investigations are so critical. Finally, the fourth lesson. Some airlines still appear unskilled at family relations. <laughs> Chinese relatives of those on board have wailed and protested, then learned their loved ones were lost in a text message. When families are aggrieved and there's a loss of a loved one or loved ones, you can't leave this to chance. You can't make it up as you go along. Just four lessons with so many more in those black boxes on the bottom of the Indian Ocean as their locator signals start to fade. For this week, David Curley, ABC News, Washington.